Well, uh, Daphne's taken the wind out of my sails completely because she's taken, stolen at least half my elegant speech. <laughs> but firstly, I would like uh, to thank Robin and then Daphne for her amazing uh, talk about me. I didn't know I was such a nice chap. It's quite a... <laughs> well, anyway, it's very nice. This party is exactly two weeks before my 88th birthday. So I, uh, I'm almost wishing my... And tonight we find ourselves in the hall of the Worshipful Company of Painter Stainers, a company dedicated to the visual arts and of recent years renowned for its patronage of the Lynn Painter Stainers Awards and annual exhibition now at the Malgaris, to which many of you have contributed work. I am delighted that Julian Bryant and his wife, where is Julian? He's right at the back there. Julian, thank you very much for coming along and uh, representing the company and particularly the Charity and Education Committee, which for many years made Heatherly Awards to Heatherly students and has always shown a keen interest in our activities. Thank you very much for coming and thank your committee also for their enlightened support of Heatherly's. I am pleased that we should have here, I don't know whether he's arrived yet, the a mayor of our own very own borough. Has the mayor of our very own borough has arrived? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, sir, and as councillor Charles and Mrs. Williams. Mrs. Williams, delighted to meet you, Mrs. Williams. Uh, thank you both for coming. Uh, I remark on you a little bit later in the proceedings. <laughs> 39 years and 39 days is a long space of time to compact into 10 minutes. In fact, I practiced this thing, timing it over and over again, cutting bits out. It went on for ages. So I, <laughs> I have opted for something which is superficial and slightly silly. Uh, that is, after all, it is, after all, a social occasion, and this is, I'm now moving into Daphne's territory again, this is, in fact, a family occasion. Some of us uh, have been together for over a quarter of a century, and it is quite impossible to enumerate the successes of the Heatherly Marriage Bureau. But, <laughs> but one could perhaps note a director of studies tying the knot with a bursa, and uh, to give it a touch of class, of course, and then at a more basic levels, uh, humble student levels, uh, finding myself landed with a supplementary five grandchildren. <laughs> so that is all the product of Heatherley's on the family levels. Now I turn over the page. I can, uh, this is where I start boasting. I could safely say, without fear of contradiction, that without me, Heatherley's wouldn't exist today. Well, that's a fact. Uh, <laughs> But equally, equally, <laughs> equally, again, Daphne sort of stolen my bits and pieces, uh, equally it would not exist if I had not had the support of a wonderful team, or to be more precise, two teams, the trustees of the charity founded by Helen Wilson, who have given freely of their time for absolutely no financial reward. Thank you very much indeed. And... Secondly, the academic and administrative staff of the school have tra transformed my 30 shilling investment into the magnificent school we have today. At school, I was in the dream stream. My sister Patricia was in the scholarship stream. She was 18 months younger than me, but was working at almost the same level at school. She was very hard working and self-confident. Anything I could do, she could do better. So I let her. <laughs> Admiring her efforts doing things I certainly didn't want to do. Thus, at an early age, I learnt the fine art of delegation. <laughs> and I would suspect that my greatest achievement at Heatherley's, again, Daphne's already covered it, has been just that, choosing the right people and making encouraging noises. In 1969, Pittman's destroyed Heatherley's in every respect but one, its name, and it's so be the name for 30 Bob. For those who are not even remotely superstitious, it was close to magic. The Inner London Education Authority came forward and sponsored uh, 60 hours a week of adult education class and tutors in, in the school, and Bill Coastley with the Slade conjured up talented postgraduates as tutors. 
Daphne and Susan have been with Heatherley's for 40 years. Good gracious. Daphne now a trustee, Susan director of the portrait diploma. There were tricky moments. At one time virtually roofless, we had our day classes in some disused chemistry laboratories and our evening classes on the first floor of the Blackpool pub in the Fulham Road with pints of beer between the legs of easels. Actually, it was quite, it was quite fun, really. <laughs> Happily, in 1978, the Chelsea Westminster Institute found us uh, um, a relatively stable, secure site, our home at Ashburnham Old School, and when Maggie Thatcher wickedly got rid of the ILEA ten years later, we were strong enough not only to survive but to buy Heatherley's its first freehold there. Again, thanks to Daphne's husband's skills, uh, that went through very well indeed. Uh, in 1990, as well as being principal of Heatherley's, I found myself both chairman of the Board of Governors and chief executive of the Federation of British Artists, a combined role I held for six years. Being chairman of the Federation charity, I could not receive any financial reward for my services. I'm going to have to prop myself up on something. Being chairman of the Federation charity, I could not receive a fi financial reward for my services, but was able to receive a very nice indirect reward in the form of a gift from the Federation Charity to the Heatherley Charity of two rent-free weeks of the Mal Galleries, all the Mal Galleries. It was absolutely marvellous for a 150th anniversary exhibition of work produced by the staff and students of the Heatherley School. It was a pretty impressive show with a fresh cast from the original moulds of Gilbert's Piccadilly Eros as a centrepiece. I estimate that we have a better claim to Eros than the Evening Standard, that's for that's <laughs> dead. Uh, where was I? Yes. Now, I can't recall precisely what I said at the private view, save remarking that Mr. Heatherley was a Victorian fairy painter who painted little fat fairies sitting on mushrooms, <laughs> and observing that he was undoubtedly a magician, that some of his magic was surely still around. I think it was J.M. Barry, or was it Peter Pan, who said, Every time you say, I don't believe in fairies, a fairy dies. So I will abstain from casting any doubt upon the veracity of Mr. Heatherley's vision. <laughs> My image so inspired one dear lady at the private view that she said, came up to me and said, do you still teach fairy painting? <laughs> I suspect, and I am sure, that we have still one student, I think everyone who's in the school will know who I mean, who... <laughs> Who would have no difficulty, who would have no difficulty embellishing the life model with butterfly or dragonfly wings. <laughs> but he's a rare visionary, and I'm not sure that such a course, frankly, would sell today. <laughs> anyway, all this talk of Thomas Heatherley unbelievably reached the ears of Inland Revenue, and we received, received a quite remarkable letter addressed to him. Dear Mr. Heatherley, we don't seem to have had a tax return for you for, uh, from, quite, from you for quite some time. <laughs> this was a quite massive understatement, as to the best of my knowledge, the great man had been residing in the Elysian Fields since 1913, <laughs> which is uh, just a hundred years ago now. I informed Inland Revenue to this effect, adding that I was under the impression that the said fields lay in a tax-free zone. <laughs> Mind you, how Inland Revenue copes with reincarnation, I don't know. Uh, we had Thomas's predecessor, James Matthews Lee, and the last proprietor principal, Henry Massey, were both, as they say, re into reincarnation. Following the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb, Henry discovered that he had a previous life as an Egyptian high priest. <laughs> Clearly, the Rosetta Stone had failed to provide an adequate bit of information at an earlier date. <laughs> what an imaginative lot my predecessors were. <laughs> In 2008, 20 years on from the acquisition of our first freehold, we moved again into our present magnificent purpose-built art school. I think that while it cost more than was originally envisaged, the Royal Borough is beginning to recognise that it made a good investment, and indeed that Heatherley's promises to be a feather in its cap. And a recent inspection by the British Accreditation Council gave the school pretty well top marks, confirming the quality of the service Heatherley's provides in art education and to the local community. This is a happy note on which to retire, and something very positive for my successor, Robin Lee Hall, to build on. 
the trustees of the charity, like us all, are fallible and can and have at times made mistakes. But with Robin Lee Hall, they have made an excellent choice. A talented artist and teacher, a very capable administrator, Heatherly's future looks bright. And to continue on a serious, in a serious vein, Robert Beaver, MA, MBEMA, and Henry James, Vice President of the Royal Society of Portrait Painters, have joined me as trustees of a new charitable body, which has a very tight, restricted mandate to provide direct financial aid uh, to full-time Heatherly students for whom full remission of fees is not adequate uh, to uh, enable them to undertake a two-year course with us. Uh, our prime target will be the talented young from all social backgrounds. Uh, here we can note that during the past two years, it has been delightful to see two young men from seriously underprivileged backgrounds blossom at Heatherley's. We have undoubtedly transformed their lives. I close with my Christmas story, a remarkable series of coincidences, all absolutely true, but virtually nothing to do with Heatherley's whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I apologise to those, I, I um, read it out, uh, what was it, eight years ago at my 80th birthday. Well, it, it starts off as a beat about Heatherley's because I decided to go round and discover all the sites that Heatherley's had been at in the past. It's been all over the place. Uh, during my period, uh, from 1970, the school has known six, seven, eight different addresses. So we've moved around quite a lot. Uh, so on one, e one evening, just before Christmas, in the days when I went everywhere on a bicycle, so this is a year or two back, alas, I thought, thought that it would be interesting to locate Heatherley's earlier homes, starting at the very beginning with Dickinson's drawing rooms at 18 Maddox Street, hard behind uh, Handel's Church, St George, Hanover Square. I was very pleased to see that it has remained in character, being today a small art gallery. So 150 years, and it's still sort of in the same trade, so to speak. Heading back towards Regent Street, decorated for Christmas, I was startled by a cry from a first-floor first window. Can you help us, mate? The silly old bugger's locked us in. And there stood two office cleaners, unable to escape. And this is where it becomes completely irrelevant, but never mind. <laughs> My first thought was the fire brigade. And then I remembered that during the war, there had been rooftop walkways between buildings. And I went into the adjoining building, where staff were having a Merry Christmas drinks party. Yes, they had no objection to my climbing onto their roof, and this I did through a skylight window under the supervision of merry, merry glass in hand party goers. And lo, there on the wall of the next building was a vertical ladder to a higher level. It clearly had not been used for a very long time, but happily seemed firm and solid, and I scaled up it to find myself confronted with a roof, ha felt it hatch, a roof, I can't read my, roof uh, hatch with roof felt on it, what? Uh, which quite remarkably was unbolted, and I was able to drop down onto a conveniently sighted table and thence down two flights of stairs to meet up with the two damsels in distress who came, <laughs> who came out with such unlike, unladylike expressions as bloody hell. <laughs> One of them was of quite ample proportions, and getting her on <laughs> and getting her onto the roof was quite a challenge. And having her backside on the vertical ladder immediately above my head was frankly alarming. <laughs> However, we were greeted with chairs and offers of drinks by the neighbours with much jollity and laughter. When we got down to the street, however, we were not so well received. The fire brigade had been called while I was on the roof and I had deprived them of a heroic rescue. <laughs> As with a bicycle, drink was, in moderation, not a problem. Indeed, it could be argued that it constituted a propellant fuel. <laughs> I felt a further drink would not come amiss after all this excitement. And I spotted a lit doorway just behind St George's Church. I'm still just in Maddox Street, you know. I'm still in the, in the same place, sort of. A sign, the Maddox Club. I walked in to be told that it was a members only uh, club. And judging from those present, served only as a secondary base for those offering per personal services for which I neither had the inclination nor the financial resources. <laughs> Whether by intention or by accident, the remarkably mischievous vicar of St George's came through the door almost immediately behind me and invited everyone present to his carol service due to a start started a few minutes' time. This is all absolutely gospel. <laughs> and a few minutes' time. Uh, I alone accepted this invitation, and he put his hand on my shoulder. Well done, he said. 
clearly believing that he had saved me from a night of sin. <laughs> it, is a, it is a very fine church with a magnificent organ. I, it's rather like St. James's. <laughs> anyway, I spent a, a not disagreeable half, half hour singing Hark the Herald, Angels, before pedalling off home, and I decided that other heatherly sites would have to be inv investigated at a later date. So that is another instalment to come on another occasion, if I'm still around. Uh, then on a rather sad note, finally, uh, we were informed a couple of weeks ago that Gordon Middleton, who served as chairman of the Heatherly Charity for 16 years, had just died. So I would like to propose a toast to his memory and that of Helen Wilson, the charity's founder and first chairman, together with all those who valiantly served my Heatherleys and who are no longer with us today. So if I could propose those of you with glasses, I will grab my glass and uh, propose the toast of Gordon, Helen, and all those who can't be with us today. Well, that's the end of that, all right? Thank you very much. <laughs>